don't want to hit civilians. Martha, I will tell you, I have visited with active duty military, with veterans over and over and over again in town halls all over the state of New Hampshire. What we are doing to our sons and daughters, it is immoral. We are sending them in to fight with their arms tied behind their back. They cannot defend themselves, and it is wrong. And I will tell you this, look, America has always been reluctant to use military force. It's the last step we take. But if and when we use it, when it comes to defeating ISIS, we should use it. We should use overwhelming force, kill the enemy, and then get the heck out. Don't engage in nation building, but instead allow our soldiers to do their jobs instead of risking their lives with politicians, making it impossible for them to accomplish the objective. So loosen the rules of engagement. Absolutely, yes. Senator Rubio, you said in the last debate that ISIS is the most dangerous jihadist group in the history of mankind and that it will take overwhelming U.S. force to defeat them. Can you specifically tell us what you mean by overwhelming force? Well, first we need to understand who they are. ISIS is not just a jihadist group, they're an apocalyptic group. They want to trigger a showdown in a city named Dabiq between the West and themselves, which they believe will trigger the arrival of their messianic figure. And I'm not saying that's what's going to happen. The reason why it's important to understand that is because these are not groups that are just going to go away on their own. They are going to have to be defeated. And I believe they need to be defeated on the ground by a ground force made up primarily of Sunni Arabs. It will take Sunni Arabs to reject them ideologically and defeat them militarily. That will require a coalition of Iraqis and Syrians that are also Sunnis, but it will also require the cooperation of Jordanians, Egyptians. We should ask more of the Saudis. That will need to be backed up with more U.S. Special Operation Forces alongside them. And it will have to be backed up with increased airstrikes. And we're going to have to strike them, not just in Iraq and in Syria, but in every other part of the world where they've now created hubs of operation. They have affiliates in over a dozen countries across this planet. They have a sophisticated network of uh, radicalizing people here in the homeland and around the world. But it all begins by taking away their safe operating spaces with a ground force that a U.S.-led coalition takes on. You, again, Senator Rubio, you've already said ISIS is the most dangerous jihadist group in the history of mankind. So that would make it more dangerous than Al-Qaeda, the insurgents we fought in Iraq. We committed hundreds of thousands of U.S. troops to fight those groups. So if ISIS is the most dangerous group in history, why not commit a large U.S. ground force? Because they currently occupy Sunni cities and villages. Sunni cities and villages can only truly be liberated and held by Sunnis themselves. If they are held by Shia, it will trigger sectarian violence. The Kurds are incredible fighters, and they will liberate the Kurdish areas, but Kurds cannot and do not want to liberate and hold Sunni villages and towns. It will take Sunni fighters themselves in that region to take those villages and cities and then to hold them and avoid the sort of sectarian violence that follows in the past. And why that is important is because if Sunnis are not able to govern themselves in these areas, you are going to have a successor group to ISIS. Al ISIS is a successor group of Al-Qaeda. In fact, they broke away from Al-Qaeda because as horrible as Al-Qaeda is, ISIS thought Al-Qaeda was not radical enough. This is who we're dealing with, and they have more money than Al-Qaeda ever had. Well, Martha, what, would Martha, you do, what would you do differently to try to get those Sunni forces? They have not been coming forward. Well, the problem with the Sunni forces in the region is they don't trust this administration. This administration cut a deal with their mortal enemies, the Shia, in Iran. It poisoned the well with these countries. It makes it very difficult to cooperate with them as a result. They also, by the way, understand what u real U.S. air power looks like. They saw the Iraq war. They saw up close to so Afghanistan. They know what air power looks like when the United States is committed to the cause. And they see the airstrikes that are being conducted now, and they say to themselves, that's not real commitment. We know what real commitment looks like. The Georgianian king was in Washington three weeks ago. He told everyone who would listen that they have begged for permission from the coalition to target caravans. And the coalition, meaning U.S. leadership on the ground, would not allow them to proceed with those airstrikes. Mr. Trump, thank you very much, Senator Rubio. Mr. Trump, <laughs> you have said you will vigorously bomb ISIS. You've said we've got to get rid of ISIS quickly, quickly. How would you get rid of them so quickly? And please give us specifics. Well, four years ago, I said bomb the oil and take the oil. And if we did that, they wouldn't have the wealth they have right now. 
Now I still say the same thing because we're doing little pinpricks. We're not even bombing. If somebody's driving a truck, they give notice to the person driving the truck we're going to bomb. If they don't get out of the truck, the truck sails away with the oil. We actually have a case where we don't want to bomb the oil because we don't want to hurt pollute the atmosphere. Can you imagine General Douglas MacArthur and General Patton saying we can't bomb because we're going to hurt the atmosphere? You have to knock the hell out of the oil. You have to take the oil. And you also have back channels of banking. You have people that you think are our great allies, our friends in the Middle East that are paying tremendous numbers of doubt, tremendous amounts of money to ISIS. So we have to stop those circuits. Nobody knows banking better than I do. They have back circuits, back channels. Tremendous amounts of money is coming in through the banking system. So between the oil and the banking, you will dry them up. But it should have been done four years ago, not now. And, and what would you do in those cities where there are people who we are trying to help, who ISIS is essentially help, holding hostage? You have to go in. First of all, when you take away their money, when you take away their wealth, that'll very much weaken. And it'll happen fairly fast. They'll last for about a year based on all of the wealth they've accumulated. But when you stop the banking channels and when you stop the oil and take the oil, not just bomb it, take it. When you do that, it's going to dry up very quickly. They're going to become a very weakened power quickly. Thank you, Thank you. very much, Thank Mr. You. Trump. Let's turn to Libya. Governor Bush, it is a country in chaos. There is no government. This week, defense officials said there are now 5,000 ISIS fighters there, roughly doubling previous estimates. We know you and others have been critical of the administration's handling of Libya after the initial airstrikes that you supported. But this is a problem you would stand to inherit if you're the next president. Reports this week said the administration is considering new airstrikes, possible special operations raids, would you support renewed airstrikes or any U.S. involvement on the ground? I would, and I would do it in concert again with our Arab allies and with Europe, most particularly in this case. This is the lesson learned in history. If you bomb something and not do anything as it relates to deal with the aftermath of this, if you don't have a stable government, you get what we have in Libya. Uh, and this is not leading from behind, it's not an effective policy. We have to lead. Without the United States, nothing seems to work. Europe doesn't have the ability to, to, to lead, forward lean in this regard. And so dealing with the caliphate it is important because it now has spawned other areas. There's been 70 plus attacks in 17 countries, either inspired by ISIS or organized by ISIS, Libya being the most important one now. We have to t deal with the caliphate with building a Sunni army there, but we also have to deal with it in Libya. And I think the United States ultimately is going to play, a, play a, a significant role in this. The problem with the Obama administration is that they see this incrementally. They're reluctant. They don't lead. No one knows whether we're serious. And when we do it, we do it in increments they can barely see. The United States has to lead in a much more aggressive way than we're doing right now. Thank you very much, Governor Bush. Dr. Carson. Yeah, I, I want to say something about this because I'm not here just to add beauty to the stage. Um, <laughs> You know, I've been talking about Libya for quite a long time. I think I was the first one to start talking about it because I say we have to have a proactive foreign policy strategy. And of course, the next place that ISIS is going to attack to is Libya. If you want to expand your caliphate and increase your influence, then you're going to go to a place that's strategically located. You go north across the Mediterranean, you're into southern Europe. You go south, you're into Chad and Sudan and Niger. And not to mention the fact that you've had much more oil than you do in Iraq. That's the kind of place that they're going to go to. Therefore, we need to be thinking about how do we prevent them from tacking over there. They're already sending their fighters there. We need to be consulting with our military experts and asking them what do they need in order to prevent ISIS from being able to take over Libya. That's going to have Martha. enormous consequences. And would you for support us. renewed airstrikes? Uh, I would support the possibility of renewed airstrikes if in conjunction with our Joint Chiefs and our military people, they felt that that was an appropriate strategy. The fact of the matter is, none of us up here is a military expert. And uh, we sometimes act like we are, but we're not. And if we actually sit down and talk with them and get them to understand our plan and get their 
impression of what needs to be done. I think we're going to make a lot more. Martha practice. and David, I just we're going to move Martha on. Martha and David, Martha, thank what? you. We're just going to we're going to stay on ISIS here and the war on terror because, as you know, there's been a debate in this country about how to deal with the enemy and about enhanced interrogation techniques ever since 9/11. So, Senator Cruz, you have said, "quote Torture is wrong, unambiguously." Period. Civilized nations do not engage in torture. Some of the other candidates say they don't think waterboarding is torture. Mr. Trump has said, "I would bring it back." Senator Cruz, is waterboarding torture? Well, under the definition of torture, no, it's not. Under, under the law, torture is excruciating pain that is equivalent to losing, losing organs and systems. So under the definition of torture, it is not. It is enhanced interrogation. It is vigorous interrogation, but it does not meet the generally recognized definition of torture. If elected president, would you bring it back? Uh, I would not bring it back in any sort of widespread use. And, and indeed, I joined with Senator McCain in legislation that, that would prohibit line officers from employing it because I think bad things happen when enhanced interrogation is employed at lower levels. But when it comes to keeping this country safe, the Commander-in-Chief has inherent constitutional authority to keep this country safe. And so if it were necessary to, say, prevent a city from facing an imminent terrorist attack, you can rest assured that as Commander-in-Chief, I would use whatever enhanced interrogation methods we could to keep this country safe. Senator Cruz, thank you. Mr. Trump, you said not only does it work, but that you'd bring it back. Well, I'll tell you what. In the Middle East, we have people chopping the heads off Christians we have people chopping the heads off many other people. We have things that we have never seen before as a group. We have never seen before what's happening right now. The medieval times, I mean, we studied medieval times. Not since medieval times have people seen what's going on. I would bring back waterboarding, and I'd bring back a hell of a lot worse than waterboarding. Mr. Trump, thank you. Okay, Governor Bush, you have said that you won't rule waterboarding out. Congress has passed laws banning the use of waterboarding by the military and the CIA, as you know. Would you want Congress to change that if you're elected no, president? No, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't. And um, it was used sparingly. Uh, Congress has changed the laws, and I, and I think where we stand is the appropriate place. But what we need to do is to make sure that we expand our intelligence capabilities. The idea that we're going to solve this fight with predator the drones, killing people somehow is, a, is more acceptable than capturing them, securing the information. This is why closing Guantanamo is a complete disaster. What we need to do is make sure that we are kept safe by having intelligence capabilities, both human and technological intelligence capabilities, far superior than what we have today. That's how you get a more safe place, is by making sure that we're fully engaged. And right now, this administration doesn't do that. Governor Bush, thank you. Senator Rubio, I do want to ask you, you have said that you do not want to telegraph to the enemy what you would do as commander in chief. But for the American people watching tonight who want to know where the next president will stand, do you believe waterboarding is torture? Well, when people talk about interrogating terrorists, they're acting like this is some sort of law enforcement function. Law enforcement is about gathering evidence to take someone to trial and convict them. Anti-terrorism is about finding out information to prevent a future attack. So the same tactics do not apply. And it is true, we should not be discussing wide, in a widespread way the exact tactics that we're going to use because it allows terrorists and others to practice how to evade us. But here's the bigger part problem with all this. We're not interrogating anybody right now. Guantanamo is being emptied by this president. We should be putting people into Guantanamo, not emptying it out. And we shouldn't be releasing these killers who are rejoining the battlefield against the United States. Senator Rubio, thank you. We want to turn now to the topic of executive orders, and for that, we're going to turn back to Mary Catherine Hamm. Mary Catherine. Thanks, David. Uh, Senator Cruz, on the campaign trail, you've promised voters a lot and fast. If you're elected president, you say you'd end Common Core immediately, abolish the IRS, and do away with sanctuary cities. You've also been a persistent critic of President Obama's executive overreach, going it alone, not working with Congress. How do you intend to implement this aggressive ag agenda within your constitutional authority, especially given that it would require working with Congress and Washington players with whom you're happy to say you have a strained relationship?